Hello everyone, there's sudden calm, so I guess that's actually my cue. Um, panelists, make sure you have some coffee or water or something, make yourselves comfortable. Uh, audience, get some coffee or water or food, whatever you need, make yourselves comfortable. And um, welcome to the ninth edition of the 7 a of the International Performance Art Festival here in Toronto. And welcome to all of our fantastic visiting artists. Can we give them all a hand? I should also acknowledge, of course, the uh, organizing team, of which I'm only one member of a very democratic and non-hierarchical collective. Um, my name is Paul Cuillar. Uh, should I introduce you all? Am I going to remember you all? Shannon Cochran's at the back there, and uh, Johanna Householder's at the back there. The three of us are all founding members, so we've been at 7A11D since 1997, but who's counting? <laughs> when we had 24 collective members, we're now down to, I think, nine. Um, Tanya Mars, um, Adam, <coughs> where are you? Are you here? Oh, over there. Francisco, Fernando Granados, uh, Gail Allen, is she still here? Or did she yes, leave already? Um, Jess Dobkin, and am I missing anybody? Please tell me I'm not, because I'm such a... <laughs> I'll feel so embarrassed now and later. <laughs> Annie Chung, who's our, who's our satellite uh, member at the moment because she's at Halifax uh, working on her master's, but she's back here for the festival and we're very pleased to have her and her efforts because this is really a labor of love for all of us. Um, there's a few housekeeping details I just want to mention in case people are uncertain. The washroom is at the back. There's a corridor that we've kind of tried to make along that side, so please don't put your bags there or stand there be just because people might be going back to use the washroom. It's a little cumbersome, but I'm sure we can manage. Um, I'd also like to, admit, uh, to acknowledge uh, our two main venues, Mercer Union, where the performances will be taking place tonight, if anybody doesn't know where that is. It's directly across the street on the corner. This, of course, is Toronto Free Gallery, which is also the initiator of this particular series, the Performance Art Daily. Um, they had special funding during our last festival to uh, allow this kind of special talk lecture to take place, and it was so successful, we felt that we should continue it. All of the, um, everything that we're taping will be put online and available for you to view in the future access, because we think it's a fantastic resource of artists talking about what they do. Um, one of the key, even though most of the people here are the artists from the festival, and that's fantastic, we seduced them to lunch. And of course, everybody's welcome to the lunch. Um, one of the things, though, that's important about this is the artists have a lot of conversations, not when they're in the performance setting. So, you know, in the bar afterwards, or, you know, on the street, when they check into their hotel, it's like a constant <laughs> conversation of, of very interesting um, information, and we want to share that with the public. We want, it, we want it to be open. We know there's lots of Toronto performance artists who couldn't be in the festival this year, and we want them to feel welcome to come. Uh, we have a special, uh, little, um, and Miriam's gonna, gonna scream at me, but I don't care. Um, <coughs> we have a special little uh, uh, adjunct thing that we've done this year is we've invited a couple of curators uh, to just come and hang out at the festival and be, be open to talk to people. So that's Jonas and Miriam, so now you can see their faces. So if you wanna, you're gonna find out about what they do today, and if you're interested in their spaces, please feel free to go out and have a conversation with them. But I should also mention that most of the artists who are here organize events in their own countries. We're going to talk about that a lot today and the whole idea of artist run and the international network and what that means. So just about any artist you would talk to probably is involved in organizing or would like to put on an event or is learning about the network. So, so, um, so even though they're here in that capacity and we're inviting them to speak today, uh, you know, I, I encourage you to talk to everybody and, and um, share information. So, um, I guess I should acknowledge our sponsors, the Canada Council, the Ontario Arts Council, and the Toronto Arts Council. Uh, I can't believe that it's before 
one o'clock, and this is already our third event of the festival. <laughs> because we had Margaret Dregu doing yoga, who's here every day at 10. Anybody's welcome to drop in. We, if you have a yoga mat, bring it. If you don't, we have some in the back. Um, and at 11 each day, each day, she will do a kind of uh, interactive verb action with people. So um, feel free to come to those. And it's different every day, so don't feel if you came once, you've got the whole biscuit. Um, you all have programs, so you can see the events, of course, this evening at 8 o'clock, we're at Mercer Union. I'm almost done with the announcements. <laughs> I think I think that's all the... Am I, am I forgetting any administrative details? Oh, of course, our bloggers. So we also have three, um, three artists, curators, organizers who we've asked to blog for us during the festival. Um, Randy, who's on the panel today, is one of them. Uh, Christine Court, who's sitting in the third row, I guess, is another, and Sylvie Ferret is the third, and I believe Sylvie is blogging in French, so we're going to have a kind of <coughs> bilingual uh, reportage of what's happening. That's available through our website. If you just go to the 7a-11d.ca page, there's a, uh, an item called blog at the top um, in, in the sound navigation bar. So, uh, so if you miss a day, that's one way you can catch up. They might run a little behind because, as you can imagine, writing is an extremely uh, cumbersome task to try and report on everything, so sometimes it gets a little bit behind. <coughs> also, the French text will eventually be translated into English, but not right away. But So you can always check back later. Um, and maybe, I don't know, we'll try to translate the English into French. We'll see. That's a, that's a bigger project for us. Okay, that's it. I'm tired of talking, uh, so I'm going to let these three people talk. So I'm not going to give much of an introduction because they can speak very well for themselves. Um, this is uh, Jonas Stepp, originally from Sweden. Uh, Randy Gledhill, who uh, is based in Vancouver but has a long association with Toronto. And William Genestier from Montreal. So I guess we can just go in order and maybe you can just tell us a little bit about the various um, events, spaces, kinds of things that you do, your approach, that kind of thing. Just, just an introduction of who you are, so for anybody who may not know. Well, <clears throat> basically I'm an art historian, born in Sweden and studied in Sweden, and I also studied in France, so I've been living 25 years in France, uh, making research and uh, making my PhD studies there at the uh, École des Autitudes en Sciences Sociales. And, um, so I'm basically an art historian, art critic, and then I sort of curate contemporary art and saw some very interesting Finnish performance artists discovered suddenly performance art as such in 2001 and um, put up uh, two big biennials of contemporary art in Sweden. And um, then I, uh, we didn't get funding for the third uh, biennial, so I started actually performance of <coughs> the called Infraction in the south of France. This one, t-shirt of the latest edition. And uh, we invited like 40, 35 to 40 artists, which was like, you know, very, very happy to, to, to do. And then the following year we started another festival in Gothenburg, Sweden, 2006. The one in France was in 2005. And um, following that, we started another festival in Paris in 2009. And um, following that one, it was another festival. We also started in New York with Scandinavian artists and uh, North American too, which is discontinued now because of lack of funding. But we had only you know, two years, two fun fantastic years. And um, then I started another festival in Guangzhou, China, where I am based now at this time. And uh, so I'm organizing some festivals in Europe and China. So except for the New York Festival, all the other ones are still... Still on, and we also have a gathering. And we also have a gathering uh, every second year in Venice, called Infraction Venice, um, which is thought of as a, a meeting and uh, showing performance art, you know, outside of the frame of the of the piano to show performance art for this kind of more homing based art. So that's uh, basically what I'm doing right now. Great, thanks Jonas. Um, 
Brad, do you want to tell us about you and Lyme? Um, yeah, I, I, I wear a few different hats, and I also now also wear a tiara. Um, <laughs> as I've been, um, a new moniker is Princess Randy, under which I'm now. So, um, I've been living in Vancouver for six years or so, after living uh, for decades in Toronto. And um, I'm currently the director and um, curator of the kind of main events of the live performance art Biennale in Vancouver, which is in many ways a sort of sister event to 7 a 11 I'm really happy to be here because uh, just watching how 7 a 11 <coughs> operates um, is great. Uh, we have to share all of our information to get better at what we do. We recently had a um, retreat that Live held in Vancouver of uh, people that organized performance art events across Canada. About 20 people came and it was really low key. We talked for two days and I just held it in my studio in Chinatown. Um, it was great. It was the first time that we all got on the same page. We previously, we had never met together. Um, and everybody had a different idea of things like ethics and artist fees and um, um, all the nuts and bolts of um, hosting performance art events. Um, I love performance art. I, the thing I like about it is that I, first of all, never know what to expect. And secondly, I am always left thinking, how in the hell did they get there? Um, it's always a surprise and it's always a challenge. Hosting the events is also something of a challenge. One of the things that we take great pride in, and I'm sure we're going to see evidence of this week also, is to provide the artists with a facility and equipment to um, shine. So I'm really looking forward to this week to uh, seeing some great work. When they, when they asked me to write a blog, I was really nervous because it kind of compromises my position as a curator, maybe. Uh, but I decided to do it. Well. I don't know, to, to make opinions public is, 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 is difficult. And I was really nervous about also having to write about things I didn't like. Um, I'm trying to be positive as I age, and I'm, you know, I come from a really simple background, um, you know, having worshipped William Burroughs for decades. Um, but then I look at the lineup of artists, and after I've met them, I, I don't think I, I'm going to have that problem. I think that um, 7A 11B has done an incredible curation um, and are going to present, well, a sampling of the finest artists in the world. Thanks, Randy. That's, you should be our PR person. Miriam, <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you want to introduce yeah. yourself? So I'm Miriam Genestier uh, from Montreal, and I'm, uh, I feel a little bit like the, the odd one out because I run a center called Studio 303 that actually specializes in contemporary dance, but increasingly in interdisciplinary performance. So we do a, a lot of presenting and uh, kind of small scale presenting. Uh, lots of group shows with artists from lots of different backgrounds. The Edgy Women Festival, which is a feminist performance festival, uh, annually in March. Um, and I guess the part of Studio 303 that's really growing is support services for professional artists, uh, designed for emerging artists or artists who fall between the cracks. Uh, we have professional workshops uh, almost every day of the year and uh, residencies and some online resources as well, like um, artists sharing intimate <coughs> experiences of touring abroad, like unexpected stories. That's coming up in January. Um, and, and increasingly, I'm interested in networking and, and facilitating artist-led <coughs> networking, or also in just kind of questioning the power dynamics within a lot of networking events where, you know, the, I, I don't know if it's the case actually in the performance art milieu, because I'm, I'm coming more from a performing arts background, but uh, there's all this like speed dating and pitch sessions, and I don't know if you guys do that. It's really horrible. Sounds scary. We will now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so 
I'm kind of yeah, questioning that stuff and trying to meet with artists uh, on a regular basis to figure out other ways um, for them to connect with, uh, with the money, the power. Um, and I also, uh, apart from Studio 303, I've also had a long history of um, queer curating, uh, mostly in a kind of cabaret context. I perhaps have retired from it this year, but I haven't decided yet. <laughs> you may hear the call again. <laughs> Thanks, Miriam. So, already just in their introductions, that raises a whole bunch of interesting questions. I mean, obviously in the debates or discussions, whatever you want to call them, two years ago, um, there's a lot of talk about what performance art is, about uh, cross-disciplinary um, relationships, about uh, artists from other disciplines who kind of fall into performance because they just don't fit so well in their milieu anymore. Um, and then we have this other idea, of course, of, of um, the, the Performance Art Festival, um, largely uh, driven by artists and more, I don't know, how would I describe you in terms of, of curatorial? It's not that you're not, you're not so mainstream in a way, I would say. You're, more, you're, you're interested in a different kind of work than many you know, contemporary art historian type curators. I think you're more contemporary in a lot of ways. Um, so uh, this kind of program, I think, has a history that goes back, for example, to things like Robert Feuillieu and the idea of the eternal network, the idea that artists are meeting to create convivial situations <coughs> and to create conditions that sit outside the marketplace. I guess that's what I'm trying to say, is that you're not commercial, uh, really, <laughs> that you're not trying to, you know, uh, work within this contemporary market. So, but um, but it's really about, in a way, self-organizing and about about <coughs> presenting our own models and ways of doing things. Now, of course, in Canada, we have uh, the good fortune, at least for now, of having councils who are quite supportive of what we do, which means that when we put on a festival, we can access money and pay artists quite, you know, we can get their flight and we can give them food and give them a place to stay and give them an artist fee and the conditions are relatively good. Um, there are many other festivals around the world where, for example, uh, artists in third world countries want to be part of this network, um, want to uh, use it for various ends, uh, kinds of activism, kinds of um, uh, expression that are perhaps not so easy in their countries. Um, a lot of European festivals have lost funding over the years. Um, so the situation is always precarious, but I think artists organize events whether or not we can provide perfect conditions because, uh, because it's so important and because, because it's about um, a dialogue among us. And, and one of the things I want to emphasize, even though I'm talking a lot and I'm about to stop, is that um, this is kind of an open forum. We want there's two microphones that are available for the audience, so if you have questions at any point for any of the speakers, feel free to join. Or if you have comments, because you know most of the people in this room are, fr frankly, <coughs> probably will be up here before the week is over, anyways. So, uh, so you know, please don't let me stomp on the moderation. Um, but I, I wanted to talk, start, I guess, by talking about this idea of this network. This, uh, because that is, you know, sort of why we brought these three panels together. They're all representing different kinds of models of organization, and uh, but they're all very committed to to what artists do, as opposed to what the market wants or or, or other kinds of things. So I don't know if uh, that's more a comment than a question, but I don't know if you have some comments to offer around that. Well, uh, I mean, personally, when I when I made, worked in more contemporary, you know, object-based art, it was, you know, I was against the system from the beginning and the, uh, the commercial system. I mean, and the whole, you know, the whole the whole reward system as such. And I didn't find any place as a critic, yes, because I could, you know, criticize the, the the system as such. But then, when I, you know, went into performance art and I met these Finnish artists first, and then others, and in different countries. Uh, I felt like I came home in some way because it was not about uh, economics, finances. It wasn't so much about, I mean, at that time for me anyhow, what I understood 
about you know achieving a position or anything, but it was more you know unheroic. So that was for me extremely attractive, actually, and that was actually the bait. I mean, the, the reason why I'm into it. Um. Oh. And then. But then, I mean, also after a time in the, in the international network, you can say that you discover too that it's, it's some kind of different power positions and people try to position themselves. In the I mean, that's that's comes completely natural. I think I think it's probably human, um, but it's much less anyhow in, in this in this network than in, in, in the contemporary. Scene. I mean, in the mainstream public place. And also concerning the different ways of working, I mean, the festivals I organize, I curate. It's we have different kind of functionings in, in the festival in Sweden. Uh, we pay the fee. We do like you know you do here. But for instance, the festival we organize in in infraction set in France. We can't do that because the budget doesn't allow us because we need to have a, a certain amount of artists coming. So and in China we don't have any public funding at all. So I have to use my fees to you know, to pay for the hotel for the artists and stuff like that. So. It's different kind of functions. But I think one of the things that's important is you're trying to create this convivial atmosphere where it's really a place where artists feel comfortable, they're getting fantastic meals, and you know, that, it seems to me that's uh, an important part of how you think about uh, yeah, it's being what you together. organize, how you organize. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's about being together. It's also, of course, uh, thought that if the artist feels good, if, if, I mean, if you feel good, then you will make a good work. If you feel, I mean, if you feel bad at that situation because you work with your mind and you work with your body, then you will not make good works. And we, I mean, I as a curator want to have good works. So it comes, you know, it's 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 a, it's a double thing, in fact. you know. But of course, it's to be together. And have a, you know, nice time. Now, Randy, even though you organize, uh, I would say mainly performance at live, um, you've kind of positioned it as basically a contemporary art biennale, and and, and I've heard you speak very passionately about how this is kind of like the important art that's going on. I don't know if you want to... Yeah, um, there's a few reasons for that. One is uh, uh, it's a better pitch um, to get money. Um, and also, I really do think that <coughs> performance art is the on the, the forefront of contemporary <coughs> art now. And there's reasons for this. Um, Whereas contemporary art was basically maybe European and American centric um, uh, up until recently, up until the internet. Um, the internet's created a new democratization of the intellect uh, and allowed people everywhere um, to access information and have opinion. Um, this has really created a new network um, that's really exciting. And the artists from, I won't call it the developing world or third world, I'm trying to find a new term for it, I, and I'm kind of liking politicized south as a term, are coming from places that, um, unlike our benev benevolent democracy, um, they are actually in danger for having opinion and for expressing opinion. I don't think at 7A, 11D anybody's going to be threatened by somebody driving up on a motorcycle and shooting them in the head for um, criticizing the Pope or something like that. But in much of the world, this is the daily life and daily um, fact. And the artists that come from these regions are, are whereas we might come from a tradition of uh, post-conceptual uh, art or uh, visual art, they come perhaps from in performance art, partly because they have the uh, immunity of the uh, art institution in Artman, and they have a bit of um, legitimacy for what they're having to say. This in turn is really affecting the contemporary art scene um, everywhere. So it's incredible. You know, the new, for instance, Africa is now starting to rise in terms of contemporary art. Uh, I just made my first connection to the African art scene through Facebook. And um, they've got an entirely new way to me of expressing their thoughts, beliefs, and um, politics. So 
that's why performance art is really being enshrined by the institutions now. For instance, the uh, Kate Modern has purpose built a performance art uh, gallery. And uh, Museum of Modern Art, for instance, uh, with the recent Marina Abramovic shows and continued <coughs> shows, they really are putting performance in the forefront of contemporary art uh, instead of treating it like the court jester as they used to. So it's really exciting times. And it's really time to remember why it's vital and to try and keep that vitality. Uh, and, and Miriam, you've mentioned that your the focus of Studio 303 is primarily dance, but obviously you find something, uh, or, the, or the organization finds something really useful about having this intersection with other kinds of art and artists that perhaps may otherwise not intersect in the same way. So uh, how do you go about facilitating those kind of, uh, you know, uh, crosstalk between disciplines, between artists, and, and, and does it work? I mean, are... Do, do the two communities want to talk to, and there's probably more than two, the many, many communities who want to talk to each other, do you find? Yeah, I mean, Studio 303, the, when it was founded, it was the kind of catchphrase was dance and related arts. And I think because it's always worked with maybe more DIY, small scale, and emerging artists, um, maybe that, it's not something that, that uh, I necessarily brought. It really came from the community. Um, I remember one of the, I think we actually created one of the first interdisciplinary shows because dance artists were coming up and saying, actually, I, w I have an installation I want to do, or, um, you know, the performance with interacting with projection. And then it just kind of grew from there. So, and I'm also, I, I guess I just always found it puzzling that that there was an assumption that communities were built around disciplines, because that never really made sense to me. It was, I, you know, there was more, a, a certain generation, a certain scale of work, um, the kinds of venues or public spaces, or, you know, that people were using. I, I always found that was a, a stronger, uh, yeah, binding for, uh, for artists. So, so are you saying you yeah. think place is really important, or yeah, place, place and um, means and scale and and then of course content. Um, <coughs> say, so I've, I've always just been uncomfortable with disciplines in general. But when you're funded by you know <laughs> bodies, you have to kind of it really affects our programming or the way we uh, we express ourselves. If if I could choose to uh, be a center just for undisciplined. That's my preferred <laughs> language. And especially works really well in French, and discipline. But um, I would love to. It's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's not possible with the way the funding structures are in place. It's, it's quite infuriating. I spend a lot of my time going, okay, I'm going to call that one dance. <laughs> I'm going to call that one interdisciplinary. Damn, are there three disciplines interacting? It's like, ah, it just drives me crazy <laughs> thinking about all that. Um, but I can't remember what your uh, question was. Right? Just about the, basically, I'm just interested about this this yeah. interconnection of <coughs> communities that yeah. sometimes can be insular from each other. But as you're suggesting, that doesn't necessarily make sense. So I'm just curious about that you know, kind of situation. Because I guess one question would be, you know. Is performance art even an important or necessary term at this point? But Jonas, you already had something else you wanted to say, so don't feel you have to. <laughs> no, but I mean, festivals, the real, uh, or I curate anyhow, that's uh, pure, right? Pure, if you want. But it's, it's, it's performance. So we really, I mean, I, I, when I get emails from different theater groups or companies that they call it from French, or uh, we get dance and theater, I have to answer them that we are working with visual performance art because. Uh, I think that, I mean, if we look, look in France, for instance, they don't really have a scene. They have a scene for theatre, they have a scene for, for uh, dance. Sweden, the same thing, but for visual performance art, it doesn't really exist. So I think that it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's good to create that scene for that kind of you know, field. So I, I see a difference, and you know, it's, it's, you know. And do you think that's a role that makes sense for a curator as opposed to an artist? I only ask because 
my own situation in starting photo was really to create an audience for the kind of work I was doing, which I wasn't seeing, even though there's lots of people who call themselves performance artists. So I'm just curious about that. <coughs> I think it, it could be a difference between an artist and a, uh, and a curator, but uh, in the same sense, I think that when you work as a visual artist, I mean, you analyze your means, you analyze your, your I mean, what you work with, really. and, and uh, then the question is, do you work with choreography, do you work, how do you work, I mean, do you work with props all the time, is it a set up like in theatre, I mean, how do you really work, so, I think it's a question too for an artist, of course, yeah. and also the, the staging and you know, everything, so I see a difference too for an artist. <laughs> <laughs> but of course there are many artists who are taking on a role that they call curating, and some people do it even in consider it an artistic practice. Yeah. Um, so I feel people are very attentive, but this is kind of dead. So I want to ask you guys, what do you think are the important uh, questions that uh, we need to discuss about performance? Well, it's all about me, Paul. <laughs> is, that, is that Princess Randy speaking? No. Um, just further this, I get, of course, in my position, asked a lot of times, what is performance art? So much so that I balk at the notion. I just tell people to look it up on Wikipedia now. Um, I think the question that's more relevant is what is not performance art? And the reason for that is that there's something about the intent that defines the art form more than the uh, nature of the action. So that's what separates it from performing arts, is that it has to somehow really without filter, allow the artist a, 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 a conduit to speak directly to who they're talking to. And I think within that maybe is, that comes close to a definition, rather than trying to say, oh, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. You know, it's like, why is it when Lee Li Wen sings folk songs, it's performance art? And why is it when, um, um, Robin Poitras dances its performance art, or why is it when Margaret Drag who does yoga its performance art? And so maybe the term is wrong, but it's a handle that we've got, and we should just use it to our advantage, because it kind of defines you as the cutting edge of the avant-garde. You know, like, I don't know about here, but in Vancouver, they're calling condominiums performance right now. <laughs> um, so we should just ride it and forget about what it is and get on with uh, who we are. Miriam, I think you might have a response to that, because I'm, I'm sure you would think dancers also want a direct conduit to express themselves. Well, I mean, Randy mentioned Robin Quattras, so she identifies as a dance artist, but I agree that, that her, her work, I mean, I think there's a lot of artists like her who, uh, who and I, I tend to work more with, with, uh, with solo, uh, a bit less theatrical, DIY, um, very experimental, Forms. So for me, yeah, the, the disciplinary definitions kind of just crumble when you're at that level. And you know, when I when I talk about the disciplinary lines being uh, irrelevant, it's more you know when you see someone like Robin Quattrall and you you think, well, she's she's going after the same funding that the Grand Ballet Canadien are going after. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't make sense. I think that our arts councils are really uh, holding on to a uh, structure that really, really doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. This really is the challenge for the arts councils. That I know the Canada Council is trying to unwrangle us because the funding base was basic, was traditionally practice based. I mean, yeah, discipline, discipline based. And now that the, the, all that boundaries, as you say, are crumbling, they're having to look at ways to think practice-based instead. Um, but yeah, it's totally Makes sense. Yeah. And Studio 303 is also, we're competing against uh, the Just for Laughs Festival. Mm. Mm. You know, for heritage funding, it's just ridiculous that the same person is, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Well, I think that's true for us too. I mean, I think we're in the same funding category as like Luminato. You know? ah. <laughs> they get a different level of funding, but we're writing the same applications and being seen by the same jury. So 
you know, it, it can be problematic in those terms. If, if mm -hmm. the idea of the artists around, or artists, excuse me, uh, the arts councils in Canada was around um, peer evaluation of art, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I just thought, I mean, for me, it's, it's not a question of that. What, what is the definition of action? What, I mean, who gives, I mean, <laughs> honestly speaking, I don't care about that. I think that there are other questions that is much more interesting and much more important. Actually, it's what is what is what is, what, is, what can be what can be the function of action. Or, and um, I take one of the festivals you organize is the one in south of France, where we really go out to the audience in the street, go to normal people who is not at all initiated into the art scene, and um, we did that with a kind of how to say um, utopian, idealistic sense that. Yeah, we will, you know, bring contemporary art to these people and they will, you know, get something from it. And in the beginning it was very difficult, it was very hard. The first two years were scandals because we brought these crazy people to this small city of 40,000, you know, in, uh, villagers in, in the south of France. It wasn't easy for sure. But now, you know, after eight years, they are actually asking for it to come. They're asking, you know, to see these artists coming, doing these strange things because they actually what does she want to say with this performance and everybody? So after a while we you know, understood that we have to speak in a certain way with the audience and actually we made them understand, uh, which a lot of them, I mean I don't say that all of the, all of the citizens understand that, but a lot of them understand that we want them to you know, reflect by themselves. It's all about themselves to see, to feel, to experience something and not to get a message or see you know, art that is on, on, a, on a statue or something. But, um, you know, so they could have a better life. And, and actually, after eight years, even last year, I could say that, you know, we have actually reached that objective by going to the people on the street. So I think that it's other questions than definition that is, you know, could be more interesting, like what can performance or through its specifics, like mobility, like uh, its human scale, like its non-spectacular uh, expression, bring to society. I think that's, you know, we have a lot of other things that just create things inside the white uh, uh, contemporary art center. You know, it's, it's, so I think it's other question that is more interesting. Yeah. Well, Miriam uh, talked in terms of place, and you're talking in terms of mobility also, and I think those are important terms. I mean, it's very important to us that this is an international festival, that we're bringing bodies physical bodies of artists from other places to be here, to enter into a dialogue with us. But it's not, it can also be difficult because uh, there are language barriers, there are cultural barriers, there are differences of even thinking about what performance is. And I think we invite artists here to have those conversations, but um, as an artist who travels, I also find it sometimes very difficult to enter another place. You know, you're parachuted here for a week, and what do you have to say to these people who you have no idea who they are? Where do you start that dialogue? So I'm, I'm curious about how, within this structure, or whether we need other structures, we begin to answer that question. Randy, I think you should start. Um, yeah. So, it's all, it's all. And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that we're trying to do with Live in Vancouver is um, turn it into a young, younger organization, which means I'm kind of shooting myself in the foot <coughs> because when that's successful, I'll, I'll be booted out, I hope. Um, but to us, the, the emerging artists are really the future. And so we've tried to integrate them in many different ways to our activity, um, from being on the board of directors to um, performing in the festival and to curating and or selecting and um, um, en engineering their own um, kind of uh, festival within the festival. Um, I find that the, 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 the emerging artists are also, because of the nature of um, um, immigration, are much more culturally diverse than my generation of artists. Um, you know, um, and the sooner they take over, the better. So, in terms of networking, in, introducing them to the international artists 
is a big deal for them. And also the opportunity for the international artists to see what the emerging artists are up to is a big deal. As the 85-year-old John Dupuy commented, um, this gives me life. Um, so that however you do it, connecting the artists of your place with artists from other places, that's what creates a network. And uh, the friendships that, and the bonds that happen during festivals, it can be like Stockholm Syndrome sometimes, um, is a lifelong thing. You know, I know people that I've met on the circuit are my best friends. I, I don't know anybody who lives in my apartment building, but I um, <laughs> Skype with people Except around. your partner. Except my partner, that's right. <laughs> when she's in town. I Skype with people all over the world every day. Um, and many people I've known through five or six cities. Um, and they've become my best friends. So I think that's the key to the network. And you know, also the opportunity that there are a lot of influential people here from around the world. And people do get discovered. If you do brilliant work, you'll get picked up and then you'll become part of the network and you know if there was any way to make a living at it which is of course there isn't it would be the most it'd be the, the, sort of the best job in the world you know traveling around and performing and hanging out with geniuses um it doesn't get better <laughs> Um, yeah, what you said about emerging artists being the future rang a bell a bit, um, in terms of emerging cultural workers too, or, or programmers. I, I regret that now, after, you know, at this age, now I'm getting invited all over the world because I don't really want to travel anymore. Oh, right. <laughs> Fifteen years ago, I was so thirsty <coughs> and hungry for that, and I could have done so much with it, you know, and I think it's a shame that... Well, it, maybe it's changing. Maybe there's young, you know, more opportunities for young programmers or younger artists to, to travel. But I think it being, you know, those are the ones we should be investing in. And then another kind of concern I have is uh, I, I feel an increasing responsibility when I do go somewhere far away or I receive artists from far away to make the absolute most of it because I have also this increasing guilt about the environmental impact. Of, of traveling, and I feel like that's kind of a taboo topic. Like, you know, the arts are so sacred that we're, we never actually question, yeah, when, how much, when is it worth it? When is it not worth it in terms of those impacts? And I feel also that there's such, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of glamour and a lot of pressure for international networking, but we actually do so little networking in our own communities even sometimes, in my case, in my own building where I work, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I don't even you know, see the exhibits <laughs> on the floor above because I'm so focused on a, a larger outreach. Yeah. You talk about um, travel, and, it, and it, it's an, an interesting subject that people are trying to address because um, everybody's kind of conscious of cultural tourism, which has the same problems as any kind of tourism. Um, and parachuting yourself into a place, especially if you try to make some kind of political gesture about the place, it usually ends up in a kind of naive, st stupid failure. Uh, in Vancouver, we have, of course, the notorious downtown east side, and it's a very difficult, politicized, damaged place. And we hold our festival there. And uh, some of the artists, try to engage with it. And it's really dangerous because it becomes really exploitive because all of that um, uh, tragedy becomes exotic and it becomes exoticized. And that's something that we really have to be careful about, you know, but that's personal choice, I guess. But sometimes it's my artists who have that same tragedy going on in their own countries. So nobody has tragedy like the downtown East Side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Artists from around the world come and they go, I've never seen anything like this anywhere. I've traveled all over the world. But that's just our... I don't know, I think if you're in Calcutta, you might feel different. 
Anyways, that's another topic. That is another topic, but I think this is really important because um, it's certainly something we struggle with. I mean, we try and invite uh, emerging artists from Toronto to be part of our festival. Um, we're obviously not doing a good enough job because they seem to be the ones that are less likely to be here for the whole day, even though this year we said, okay, we're going to give them all per diems, so they're going to feel like they have to come here every day, right? Um, so we need a better strategy. We also have a problem that, for example, for this festival, I think it's the first time we didn't do any call for submissions because there were so many artists from around the world that we already knew were fantastic and we wanted to invite. We thought, it's stupid to do a call for submissions when you've got two spots. I mean, that's not fair to the artists. And, you know, so we're doing different strategies of trying to travel to different communities and they all here to meet younger artists. But, but I, think it's, I think it's a question. I mean, I worked in artist-run centers, running performance art programs for 15 years before I actually managed to connect <coughs> with the international circuit. It was around, when I started in 85, and it was around 2000 that I started to have an international profile. That's, and that's somebody who was trying to be extremely connected. You know, I think we come to these structures and we see them as fairly transparent in terms of how the festival works and how people network, but I don't think that's evident for younger artists, even as we try to encourage them, even, you know, even as we bring them onto our collective and try to mentor them and, you know, I mean, I don't know what we need to do. It's a big question for me of how we can, how we can better serve the emerging art community and, and make, help them feel that this is their structure to get involved with and change. Of course, we also don't want to be completely kicked out, <laughs> since for me this is the only structure in which I operate as an artist. But, but I, I don't know if you have any more insights into that question of, well, so how, how do we connect with younger artists? We're not serving them. Um, we're um, including them. Uh, one of the things we're doing for the next live is we've invited Jürgen Fritz, the great um, German uh, artist and educator, um, to come and do his intensive workshop in the week prior to the festival. And we're going to invite, we're going to have an open call, and we're going to invite six local emerging artists and six international <coughs> emerging artists to do the workshop and then uh, they're going to design a way to be included in the festival that we don't know what it is yet. But um, I really like that idea of mixing up local and international young artists on another scale. They have a whole other conversation, you know, uh, that we don't, we don't know the code. But uh, I think Francis could maybe comment on that because he really is someone who did come up and find his way to into the performance milieu. I think I can. Well, it's not. Okay, we're opening this up, so talk amongst ourselves. <laughs> uh, is it on? I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Um, well, I mean, live was an extremely important structure for me, and, and specifically the ways in which you, Randy, opened up live for emerging artists by asking um, Bally Saints to curate the, you know, the first uh, emerging, emerging artist series back in 2005. No, 2007. As somebody who was particularly interested in working live and who didn't necessarily have a connection to the kinds of art that get a lot of support in Vancouver, which is sort of more photoconceptualist stuff, um, live was really the only structure that was available to me in order to really become an artist uh, and be able to sort of come out the other side, move here to Toronto and have a community. Um, and I think it's, it, it, it's, it's the kind of thing where <clears throat> when, you, uh, when the space has been made for you, um, then you feel the onus to uh, continue to make that space for other people. So, you know, the, uh, for the next uh, biennial, I curated the Emerging, uh, the emerging Artist Series, um, and then now I'll be curating a, a, the Emerging Series for FADO. And so, you know, and, and hopefully the, the people who sort of come into that circle, you know, the people for whom that circle is opened up to them, will get that opportunity and will continue to um, open it up, but definitely, you know, I mean, if it wasn't for, and I think everybody who knows me here, who has talked to me, 
for long enough knows, and I will have told that if, if, if it had been because of you and lie, I would be an artist. Oh, that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> or I would be an artist, but nobody would have seen it. Well, I don't know. You're unstoppable. You would have found another way. And in the, in the festivals that uh, I organize, we don't make any difference between emerging and, uh, you know, uh, submerging. Huh? Submerging. Submerging, whatever emerging. But I mean, we don't know. I'm a submerging artist. That's good. Nobody talks about me. <laughs> but I mean, we don't make any difference between uh, uh, an artist who comes from an old school, I mean, who is a student, still a student, and uh, uh, Tanya Morris, Alistair McLennan, I mean, who are well known. I mean, we, why should I go from the best, I mean, highest uh, art schools or academies? But I mean, is that the thing? No, it's not. I, I think that it's the work, so it's, it's, you have to see images and, you know, make a selection. And I also think that it was what is quite good in a festival structure is that when you have, like, uh, some people who are quite known, and then you have artists who are not so known, and you bring these two energies together because they have different motivations during a festival. Uh, the older ones they have to show for whom. Well, if they if they have younger artists there, they will have to show who they are, and the, and the younger artists will have to show for the older who they are. But if you only, for instance, have real known artists who knows each other, who is going on the same circuit all the time, you will have like you know, okay, I saw this in. in that place, I saw that in that place, or you know, so you don't create that kind of energy which I think a festival, I mean, should have. And I think it's the importance of the mix of generations. Also, for another reason, is that uh, if the older ones come good to the younger generation, you know, their knowledge, their, uh, their, you know, what they know, because everything is not just the work, it's also when people sitting around the table discussing. If you, if you can't connect the old generation to the younger one, then it's like, you know, what do we do this for? So I think it's, it's, I mean, in my mind, anyhow, it's no kind of difference between emerging uh, and submerging, uh, submerging <laughs> or <laughs> renowned. Or, Can you make a note of this? No? Yeah. Okay. It's, uh, oh, everybody's an artist. And then, of course, we come to the question, what, you know, we think is good or bad. That's just... I, I, well, wait, go ahead. microphone's here. Oh, Use just, the microphone, just, please. Just because you were speaking. Uh, I'm very curious about that. Uh, no, I'm very curious about the fact that you have been in the best of all different countries, all of which have uh, different funding structures. What is, like, like, are you always constantly mixing up, like, 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 how are you making sure, what's the variable? Like, like, are you saying to some artists that you're working with in some countries, we can pay you this artist fee in this country, but we can't pay you this artist fee in this country. Like, how does that work with exactly? Like, how are you getting those things happening? Can you ask me? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's quite. Uh, I mean, it's quite simple. It's like if you go for uh, to a museum who has a great budget, of course you have to ask them a thousand, you know, dollars, or, you know, the, the budget. <laughs> but if you, I mean, in, in Gothenburg, for instance, we have quite a good budget. We have expenses that are different than in in, in South of France. So there we can give you like a good, you know, a good fee for the hotel and everything. Uh, in the south of France, it's a different kind of structure. There we have to have a certain number of artists because we have to go to the markets. That's our objective, is to bring out art to the people. And it's quite hard, it's like six days. So we have to have a higher number of artists and we can't pay, you know, I mean, the fee. So we create something else. We create a kind of, uh, what can we give them? We can give them a very nice time. Right. So that's what we were working with the beginning, very nice time. In China, uh, well, I mean, I, I had to pay the first two years, uh, most of it, <coughs> with my own fees, you know, so. And, uh, and we find that our, like the artists who, well, are there some artists that aren't going to go for the nice time? They're just going to Yeah, Roy Varner comes, he pays his own ticket. If, I mean, he had to do that the first year, for instance, in, in, in China, because he wanted to be in the festival. And I mean, there are other artists too, I don't have to mention that. I mean, it's it's also a thing of you know being together. It's you know that people appreciate of you know being in, in a good context. So it's different. But it, I mean, of course, the best thing would if would be if we had uh, funding in China or in, in France that would give us you know. The, the Have you ever brought in like market sponsors? Like, is there? BMW. Well, I mean, it, it would be nice to have BMW. I, I worked with the first two uh, Viennese I did. I was working very hard to get you know, private sponsors in, in the contemporary field. 
but I put in so much time and it gave so little result and it's, you know, it's, it's for me, my experience is that it's a waste of time. Sorry, I'm just going to ask people to use the mics because it works much better for the <coughs> video that we upload afterwards, otherwise you can't really hear what people are saying. Um, the other th part of your question is, for example, sometimes we have a nice coming from China or Vietnam or some, somewhere where they just aren't going to have the resources to get here, so we might have to fund them better than an artist we're bringing from a different context. You know, and so we have to make some allowances for that sometimes in terms of, you know, how can we actually give this person access to this world? And, and you're, Christine, you, I think you're talking about an issue of ethics, which is something that we really discussed at the retreat that we had. Um, and it's a complicated issue. Um, for instance, Mossad had a performance festival in Yangon in Burma. Um, and he paid artist fees, like 300 bucks, that he raised from the Principles Foundation. Um, it's like that much, you know, t uh, Burmese money. Um, it was an incredible gesture. Champon Apisak, who does uh, Asiatopia with um, Nepal. Nepal. Um, they have a kind of sliding, uh, <coughs> and that goes right to dinner. I remember that when B, the great uh, social butterfly, um, um, took us out for dinner, it was a Dutch date dinner at a beautiful restaurant by Waterfall, it was just spectacular. And then the end of the evening, she went around and collected the, everybody's um, dinner money, and I got nails for my tourist fees, as did the European artists. And the Burmese artists ate for free. Um, some people probably even got the leftover booze. It was incredible. It was like, this is how you do it, you know? And also, the, the Asia Tobia really supports Thai artists um, to come and participate. So, in a way, you're sponsoring them uh, by participating. Yeah. But uh, some festivals are more, um, I don't know what the word is. Um, Exploitive, maybe that they they, they ex or some museums the same, um, but that's an artistic choice, you know. Um, that if you want to go and perform, you go and perform. Everybody's got a different opinion. But what I can't stand really is when you have different levels of uh, how do you say? Uh, for instance, when a festival pays one artist more than another artist, that's something I couldn't stand because, and also that's a thing that I see is very normal in the theatre world, for instance, or dance world, it's like they, they, they sociologically, it's, it's quite different way of behaviour, and uh, I mean, so for instance, in the festival I organize, it's always everybody the same, but of course an artist from China costs more to bring in, but in place, everybody the same. I think that's quite, a, you know, that's a principle. But I think I think attitudes vary on that. When we did the retreat, which I was also at, that Randy was talking about, there were mixed views. Some festivals say, "No, we want to highlight more emerging artists. We want to we pay them a lesser fee. It's stupid to have them doing their first show out of college and getting this huge artist fee and thinking that's the way it's going to be in the world forever." You know, there were these are different attitudes. I'm not necessarily expounding them. I mean, Seven A tries to pay everybody equally in terms of equal means, everyone gets their airfare, everyone gets the same per diem, everyone gets the same artist fee, those kinds of things, but, you know, but there are other, there are other models and there are other, other thoughts on that issue. Ishtan wants to talk. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Is it on? Yeah. Hey, Randy. Hey, Ishtan. You know what struck me the most when you were talking about uh, performance art? You said that now performance art is the foremost uh, leading uh, form. I, th I think it's bullshit. I think uh, it was 40 years ago or 30 years ago is the really the, the leading force in the arts and uh, today it's more like corrupted and get into a kind of institutionalized system. What you are talking about exactly. I mean this is how much we are going to get paid. How, how is it going to be organized? Who is going to be the curator? It's all the formalist, institutionalized system what you are trying to copy. And, and you are saying that because 
uh, performance art lights in the MoMA, and I don't know the whatever big museum, then it's the leading form of uh, today. Do you think it's What's really the... What is the, on the edge? Uh, excuse me? What is on the edge? What is on the edge? Yeah, what's on the lead, what's the leading edge form of this, do you think? I don't know, yoga. <laughs> 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 Submergence or... <laughs> uh, no, well, let's not uh, change now the subject. I, I want you to comment on that. Why do you think so? Why do you think that it is because uh, it got institutionalized, that it's well presented, and some artists are even millionaires, and they got really... <coughs> It, uh, like became uh, mega superstars, then that's the victory of performance art. I never said it was a victory. But I, 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 I was in the art form. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely, Ude. I absolutely, Ude and, yeah. I understand what you're saying. And um, what I was referring to was that that's happening. That whether it's good or bad, you know, you can say like 40 years ago, it was much more um, avant-garde, or when um, East Klein pretended to jump out of the window, there was something really happening, or when the early um, um, structuralists or fluxes were, were doing their actions, that it was much more radical. But um, um, the difference that happened is that it has been institutionalized, and the Tate Modern has built a gallery for it, like it or not. You know, the museums, yeah, the museums the museum are that, that they are basically, basically the museum. exploiting and uh, basically ripping off the, the whole system what you are carefully building up and, and working with artists who are really doing it for with their heart and uh, for, for a very romantic attitude as well because they love to do I this. Agree, and agree. then then they are absolutely exploit that situation for their own good. That's what well, we are. No, I agree with you. I think that, the, I mean, what we have seen for the last four or five years is a kind of well, institutionalization for sure. <coughs> when Mo Moma suddenly goes in, uh, tries to recuperate, I mean, through Abramovich uh, performance or, and uh, now they have a big, of course, they have Tate, Tate Modern who have the banks. Of course, a lot of different, I mean, Santo Pompidou will start something soon too. I mean, a lot of different institutions get into it, but I mean, they also have a problem, is that they have to find artists. And uh, so I mean, what do you have, who is like, you know, doing something else, they are probably coming up with other artists too. So there is a big problem, is that you have institutionalization, which is completely, you know, different from the world we are working in. And then you have artists like you, who is working in that kind of area, but they over there, the institutions, they want to have, you know, artists in there. The problem is how it will it happen, and I think it happens also through education that you know uh, younger artists will see where the money is. Okay, we go in it there, we do we do the stuff there, the money is there. I think you know it, it's it's gonna be like a kind of uh, process. I mean, I I I don't say it's good. I, I don't like it at all, but that's the process. I don't think young young artists are are that naive. I I think. They, I think for all the institutionalization that is taking place, there's also as much of a chance that all of that might go away when they get bored of performance art. And I think if there is a kind of thing that makes performance important is that we can do it whether or not, uh, whether or not there is money, whether or not there is institutionalization, whether or not we get invited to the, the museum, or, or, we, or if we're doing it in someone's... Uh, Basement, you know, in Vancouver, we, we, we were in a position where, uh, because of the Olympics, there was a, a, a kind of bloating of the uh, arts budget to, you know, to, to what it actually should be. And then there was the threat at some, at some point of the budget being cut 90%. Uh, and for somebody uh, in my position, uh, just coming out of university at that point, making work, uh, the feeling was, you know, well, you know. Uh, if there's nothing to make work with, then we'll make work with nothing. You know, then we'll we'll make lines in the in the wall with saliva, and we'll take a sharpie and we'll do something. You know, so if there's if if there's budget, if there's if someone's inviting you, then go. But don't I I, I don't I don't think that I will. You know, I don't think there's money to be made there. I, 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 
No, but I mean, yeah. I mean, what I mean is a structural change. I don't talk about you or I mean younger artists who are doing performance art now, but it's a structural change, and I think that change is, you know, is is is, is there, and it's, you know, this this transformation is coming, and the, the question is, what do we do about it? And and uh, that's also one of the reasons why I organize the festivals in the way I do it, because I see it as a kind of resistance towards that system who functions with different kind of pace, who functions economically completely different than the system that I uh, suppose that I'm into. And I can just take one example, like one very good example actually. If you, if you look at the UK scene, if you look at um, the advancement of live art in the UK, and you see what happened financially when you know, the economic, economic things went down, then you have a, a, a view of you know, how that system functions. Uh, where artists became to, uh, started to do more and more spectacular works. I mean, I mean, I don't have to name any artists' names, but I mean, more and more spectacular works, uh, more theatrical works. And uh, what happens now? You know, there is no more money left. So what what do they do in these artists? You know, that's, so I think it's, it's it's important anyhow to have a kind of reflection on these issues. I, I want to just address Ishvan a little bit more. Ishvan, <coughs> it is a date with the devil. And you know it because you've been going out with the devil for a long time. Always, <laughs> always. You, you accepted the Governor General Award. When you were invited to the Venice Biennale, you'll go. And when they build a special wing of the AGO for you to perform it, you will be there. Who doesn't? Who should say no to that? I mean, who should say no to that? The question more, the question more is, how do you stay relevant as you age? Yeah. Well, being a submerging artist is my greatest life achievement. That's what. That's all. Yeah. But I was able to actually emerge. <laughs> I mean, the reward system is there. You have the Biennale, you have the, the museum shows, you have everything. It's there. I mean, should you, as an artist, honestly speaking, if somebody comes and gives you Mercedes Benz, will you say, no, I don't want it? I mean, of course, you can sell it later, you can use it as you want, but I mean, it's, it's completely ridiculous to, to say, like, uh, to be a socialist, you have to have a worker's wage. I mean, come on, we are in the... You know, he shouldn't say, like, yes, I want to... He doesn't say that. He's, he's well, talking about something that. important. You said that everybody, every artist has to be paid the same wage, no? Everybody who is invited to the festival has to be paid the same money, no? That's what you said. I didn't say yeah, that. I said no, that. You, you said that. Said you said that. Said you said because it's equality. It's a question about... Because what? it's a question about respect and equality. Sorry? No, you are talking against it. Not at all. Not social. Not at all. Like, what I'm saying is that if somebody gets invited to a museum show or gets an award, like Li Wen got the award of national, uh, I mean, from the, from the state of Singapore, or, or uh, Tanya got the general award here, I mean, would you say no to it? Come on, it's like ridiculous. I mean, if you get a museum show, would you say no to it? Come on. It's like. You know, I want to address for a moment this, this question of artist institutions. The, part of the reason we were at, in Vancouver now is that there was a, a conference going on which, is, which was organized by the artists run centers across Canada called Institutions by Artists. But for me, this question of the MoMA and that Marina Abramovich getting this kind of recognition, for me is not so important or relevant. I don't expect to ever be in the MoMA or even the VAG or, you know, that's not who my audience is. That's not who my work speaks to. I'm in this particular network because I find an audience that I can speak to here who kind of like the light glimmers in their eyes when, 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 when we do stuff together. You know, and that's to me more important than those other questions. But in terms of institutionalization, certainly it's important for us, you know, 7A has just gone through a stupid process where in order to continue to receive money after, you know, uh, have fi whatever, 15 years of, of successfully creating festivals as a collective, we had to incorporate or we would lose our money because they can't trust us unless we're incorporated. I mean, that's a ridiculous process and it wasn't an easy process for us because we really had to ask ourselves, is this going to affect us? Is this going to change what we do? I mean, certainly our values around institutionalization are about, I want to make sure if I invite an artist to do something, they're going to get paid. You know, that's really important to me because I know that system is out there and I can exploit it. I mean, Richard Bartel says, I steal money from the state to give it to artists. And he thinks that's his greatest accomplishment. And, and even though Richard and I aren't the best of buddies, I think that's pretty noble on a certain level. And, you know, I also think it's very important that you give artists the best possible conditions. It's the kind of thing Jonas was talking about. And 
that requires a kind of institutionalization, but not necessarily an institutionalization of the way we frame it for the world. Thanks, I'm curious what Tanya had to say. She sat back there. Oh. Where did she go? She's going to leave. Oh, there she is. She's got the mic. Yeah. Um, I think networking is really important. Mm -hmm. I was involved in the artist run culture early on in Canada when the only way that artists of my generation at that time got gigs was if they knew somebody in another part of the country. You have to understand Canada is huge. Um, so the A.A. Bronsons knew the people at the Western Front who knew people at the AQ in Montreal and so they had their network and it was kind of a closed network. And what happened in about 1974 or 75, um, more and more artists in more and more places in Canada decided that they wanted to um, be part of that network. And something was organized at a national level to share. And it wasn't a perfect situation, but it was a noble and ideal, idealistic um, notion. And I really think that what you, this configuration of artists, this international configuration of artists is, is an extension of that kind of ideology where, you know, it's important to stay open, it's important to not think of emerging artists as only artists who are 20, but that there are people who um, are of all different ages and generations who suddenly become interested in performance and are doing performance. Um, there are people who abandon performance, um, and so uh, just from a personal point of view, I didn't perform outside of Canada until 2005. Um, and uh, Ishpan and Paul and people like that were always going, we should travel, we should travel, and I'm going, I'm scared to travel, I don't know anybody anywhere, you know? And I think that once you meet one person somewhere who's nice to you, and then they introduce you to somebody else who's nice to you. I know it sounds corny, but I do think that this is really important. And uh, you know, you share a meal, you share a couple of drinks, you have a few laughs, you you look at their work, you find people whose work you like. I, I, I think that um, that that's one kind of network that exists, and that's the network I love the most. I don't really care about the other networks. There are parallel networks. Yeah. There are parallel networks in all fields. I tell my students, you know, you have to assess your level of ambition. If, you're, if your ambition is to be an artist who moves in the museum circuit, there are certain hoops that you have to jump through. If you're an artist who wants to be engaged in your local community, then you, you jump through different hoops. You know, if you want to be a Canadian artist and be successful only in Canada, if that's your ambition, you can do that. So. Um, I think it's kind of pointless to argue about Marina Bramovich doing reenactments at the MoMA because it raises the profile of performance as a, as a medium. And I kind of agree with Ishban, and I kind of disagree with him that, I, would, I don't like the word avant-garde, but I, I do think performance is still marginalized. It's still the margin of the margin. It's the hardest medium to work in and make any money. Um, we do need to eat. Most of us have other jobs. Um, so I still think it's the margin of the margin. But maybe well, what you're saying in the end here, Tanya, uh, that you have to have another job to eat. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's also why performance art has, you know, kept its, its inner glow in a way, because you don't have to go out to reproduce and sell the same kind of logo uh, work like in other media. Because no. mm -hmm. you have the freedom to you know, change and do what you want, but you don't have the gallery owner who says, like, no, I can't sell that painting, you have to make that one. Yeah. No, but I mean, it's, I, that's what I see. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the strengths in performance is that you, you, you can go from any kind of, you know, from any kind of matter, object, uh, whatever you use, you can go from anything, you can go f just from your body to anything. And you don't have to repeat anything if you don't want to. And I think that's you know that's the strength that performance art has as a, as a medium is this possibility to to you are completely free to do what you want. 
But when you talk about artists and works with object art, they have more or less, you know, a logo, a kind of form, obviously, because because like the, a brand. yeah, it's a brand, the brand mark. I mean, brand brand art. You know, it's, it's, they they are they're reproducing logos or brand art. You know, brands. It's like uh, I mean, in art history, you have some very good examples like Cesare. He wanted to change his work. The, the gallery only said no way. I mean, there's a lot of other examples. Life is hard, life's a bust. to do what you do, and you do what you must. To do what you must do, and you do it as well as you can. That's by an unsuccessful artist named Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> That's because he wasn't doing performance that he was not so, so successful. Oh well, no, it's the same in any, it's the same in any thing. If you are trying to communicate, if you're trying to Give the world something that's a little bit dangerous. It's going to be hard to make a living because you know, even if it, you know, it's some painting a guy puts in a condo, maybe it'll blow up. I don't know. You know, like it's it's hard. It's it, you know to be honest. No matter how you talk. You know, Do you think it's dangerous? Really? I think it's dangerous. I think, it's dangerous. I think that it's the basically. Dangerous? I think it's basically. <laughs> The greatest weapon against fascism that there ever was is um, expression, human expression. It's the most dangerous thing. Ideas are the most dangerous thing to somebody who's um, um, trying to have control. And it's that which we lust after. So, For me, it's less about that it's dangerous than it's essential. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to point out we have about Ten minutes left, so if you have a burning question in the audience, please, now's your chance. Discussion, uh, Dennis, if you can go to the back. Of course, uh, the discussion will continue throughout the next days as well through Sunday, so, and indeed Ishvan is uh, moderating one of the panels, so I'm sure yeah, 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 lively yeah, one. <laughs> more lively than my kind of drone, but, um, uh, but please, we have about ten minutes. Dennis, go ahead. Yeah, I'm speaking on the matter of the of the performance art and its sure? openness and uh, diversity. I mean, of course, the, the format of the performance festivals, it, it helped a lot of artists to, to carry on with developing their activities in performance art. And also, as uh, when you organize and invite people, uh, it's often even not enough to see at the photos, right? So you need to see the person, what he or she is doing. And uh, in a way, that creates a, a, a circle of, uh, or cultivating a circle of uh, festival artists. So how do you, do you find this kind of networking? Uh, I mean, it is great too, it's a great vehicle, but uh, don't you see it as a kind of problematic uh, issue with cultivating only a certain type of performance art? Yeah, to me, that's a very good question, actually. <laughs> Uh, I think I think that's one. That's I mean that's why I say I I, I can you know an, an artist uh, emergent or not just send me images. I mean maybe you're very well known and very maybe not known. But I mean if I don't know about you, how do I know about you? So I, I mean it's that's the thing. So for me it's just send images. And I think this this question brings up is that of course I can see too that it's a kind of circuit. I mean artist who goes to one festival. And I think it was uh, one British artist who said that too that. You know, if I go to several festivals, I will be seeing more, so it's going to generate more. So it's, I, can, I think you're completely right there, Dennis, that you know that it's some kind of circuit. But I think it's important. That's why it's important to you know to to be open and just receive and and, uh, and present, even if you don't know the artist, to take the risk to be able to present somebody who is probably or who is maybe not as good as you would like to. But I mean, if you don't give, for me, it's like this, if you don't give a young artist a chance. How the fuck? I mean, when, when will it happen? Do you, know, you have to go through some kind of academic uh, thing to get, you know, to get presented? No, I think it's just, you know, it's, it's, it should be more direct. Then I think about another thing, which is also a problem with networking, is Facebook. I, as a curator, I see that there is um, uh, a change, uh, I mean, in, even in my own behavior, but less now since I'm in China, I don't have Facebook. But I see on others is that those who are very active on Facebook 
are invited more to festivals, whereas others who is not so in, so active on Facebook get you know less invitations. And that's I just want to say that that's I see that you are also conscious about that here in, in Toronto. And I can say that I am very you know I'm also very conscious about that in the festivals always. So the, the problem is to get the information. And I just wanted to bring up another uh, thing just short. Uh, is the question of open calls. We don't do open calls because for me it resembles too much to a jury selection, which means that if an artist sends in uh, the material for an open call, it will become, you will have to reject somebody. And uh, so we don't function, we don't want to reject anybody, but you know, sending images, yes. So you say just artists should just send you material. Yeah. Absolutely. Anytime. Not anytime, worry, like, whatever. Call yeah, like that, that would be best. <laughs> no CDs, just you know, images. Delete, 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 delete. I know we're having a show. Delete, 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 delete. God, the same artist. Delete, delete, delete. <laughs> it's, it's what you, I agree with what you said to um, uh, Paul, which is that uh, networking uh, breeds partnerships. And the, the longer you're in the game, the more partnerships you have. And then suddenly this year, I, I did, you know, I had a call and very few slots to fill. And so I think there's always a, a balance um, between, yeah, partnerships, open calls. I'm attached to open calls, even though they're torturous. But I'm really attached to them because I've, I've really come across some artists that I would have never come across mm -hmm. otherwise. So I still have faith in this. <laughs> But it is a problem that you have a thousand uh, applications in uh, six spots. Yes. And you've already known who four of them are going to be filled by because they're people that they work and passion to. Yeah, you have to really, I mean, it's a jewelry kind of 19th century thing. No? I'm a big fan of curation. I, 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 and curation to me is where a, a person makes connections between things that create some kind of a language between the works that are talking, rather than just picking what you think is the best or what's the most outrageous or whatever, to actually sort of try and find some kind of a link. And we have great uh, place at Live and the 7A11D also because we're biannual. And so I get to spend a year doing research and development. Um, and I love it. I, I, um, I, I'd like to add that uh, um, 7A11D, uh, we are, we're a volunteer collective. So one of the things that happens, I think this happens at movies too, where, um, you know, I don't know all the artists who were invited. I mean, I know that some of them may have been in at Genesis Festival or some of them may have been at Miriam's or some of them may have been at Live or at Jonas's, but I don't know all of them. And so that's, to me, the beauty of my group is that they go different places than I go. And I mean, that's just even in our small group. So when you have a festival and then you meet even those people, it just kind of grows exponentially. Um, and and I, I love that. I love that we're different and that we like different people and we like different work and we meet different people who do different work. You know, all the work isn't, it's not a homogenous kind of uh, programming. Now, Paul, mm -hmm. in the old times, there were only organizers, but no curators. Now, <laughs> why was it a necessary change to have curators and organizers, administrators of these festivals? I don't know if it's a necessary change, but for me it was an important change in terms of the way I think about the work I do, because as a performance artist, what I say is I create situations. That's what I do as a curator as well, I create situations. So for me, that's artwork. So cur curating for me is just an art form, it's just, and curating is just a way to call it something that uh, people give me money, you know? When I said that FOTO is an organization that curates artists, suddenly I was able to create an organization that could receive funding when there was no new money at any level of council for such a for such an organization. We had to take money away from other 
groups for them to give it to us, you know? So for me, it was just instrumental. It was just a strategy. And it was also an acknowledgement that um, programming to me is something else. Programming is something that happens in the performing arts where it's like, okay, we're going to have three bands, and they don't necessarily have a relationship to each other. I thought it was very interesting that there are very interesting possibilities for putting together artists in constellations where their work can sit on its own, but it can also sit in a different context that it speaks to other works. And you might argue that happens naturally, and probably it does, but I wanted to foster a, a, a particular acknowledgement of that in a way of kind of talking about it that I felt wasn't uh, necessarily being supported within, within the frame that I like to work with it. If then, um, but I have a question for you. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I would like to, to just yeah. ask you like, a, what is the difference for you between organizer and curator? And well, uh, the curatorial system came in like about 15 years ago, mostly uh, to the institutions because they didn't want to talk directly to artists. They wanted to have somebody in between them because they don't like to deal with artists <laughs> most of the time. And so that's the job of the curator to do this. Now, <clears throat> we didn't have in this kind of network or other smaller networks where I work, I work in different networks, not only performance art, but music and video and other things. So I'm not used to this type of uh, work. We, we did everything very freely. Okay, you are, you know, just uh, deciding between each other what we are going to do without any another kind of interpreter of the whole thing. And if, and if I, I mean, as far as I know, like, the word created, the etymology of the word created is to taking care of yes. somebody. So, like, uh, and, and by knowing this and by knowing that most of the festivals that exist on performance art, they are um, organized by artists. When yeah. you combine these two things, what does become a curator then? Right. Well, I don't know. I don't know what. <laughs> I think, it's that you got it backwards. I, a long time ago, there was only curators. There was not organizers. <laughs> There, you said there was only organizers, there was not curators. There was only curators, not organizers. But what happened is that artists started to step outside of the institution and organize. And then that <coughs> created a, power, a new power base. And I think too, <coughs> when, when an artist curates, it's a little bit like role play. You know, well, yeah, seriously. The, there it's was a little bit like what? Role play, you know, role play. Well, like in sex, you know, when you're like, like <laughs> you, don't, you don't think I can curate my own show? I don't know my work enough to, to put it together and, and present it? No, 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 no or, not, not, not in your own work, but you know, I think, you think it needs when you're sort of like, else. I think yeah. when, when you're sort of, rather than being the person who is presenting the work, being the person who's sort of making sure that things are organized, because I, I personally find it very hard to be in charge of making sure that like the chairs are set in and then having to do my work, I would rather sort of make a strategic division of the roles, but that doesn't mean, you know, it, it is like role play in that you, you can just, when the, when the curatorial role play is over, you just go back to being an artist, you know? <laughs> What's the safe word? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're just about out of time, so uh, I don't want to ask anybody to summarize. I know, so don't worry. Um, I don't want to ask anybody to summarize because I think it's an open discussion that's going to continue. But if anybody has any last uh, comments or remarks that they want to say, uh, we'll let it go a couple more minutes. So Sylvie has the mic, but if anybody else wants to speak, they'll think, you know, go for the mic now because we're going to cut it off soon, okay? It was just a quick curating because curating, as artists, we can handle curating as we want, you know. Um, like we do with anything else. And just a, a quick note about a project I just did with Carl Bouchard and Martin Dufresne, who are also participating to the festival this week. Um, we, uh, we are friends for a very long time. And uh, we thought once that uh, we were the, the person who knew uh, the most about the other's work. So we organized for ourselves this uh, residency and exhibition uh, project uh, that we did last year. And it was very uh, privileged to spend time together and to look at our works for 15 and 20 years. 
uh, of uh, creating, of uh, sharing, of writing, uh, exhibiting, etc. And so, yeah, I just wanted to to um, to share this experience because it was curating, but in a way that we we um, we formed for ourselves uh, on the basis of what we needed and and what we wanted to to show to others or share to others. That's it. Yeah, I just want to say as well that um, uh, for me, I mean, I'm, I'm an artist uh, first of all, but then suddenly I started to. Don't no, excuse yourself. No, 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 it's not, not really excuse, I'm trying to explain because probably you don't know nothing about me, it's just to be brief. But I, I like to curate in a way, and, uh, for sure I'm not curating as a curator that uh, are doing work which I respected as well, work with visual arts, which you know the pieces that we are putting together, for example. And in theatre, for example, you don't take too many risks, you choose like maybe one piece that is doing premiere and the other ones you know already what, what, uh, what the piece is. But in performance art, the interesting thing of the curator and the interesting thing of this etymology of the word is really that you need to be near of them, not to manipulate the word because you don't know what is going to happen. And it's, it, it happens that sometimes you have a venue with five artists and that is a really crap work, you know? But, and, uh, so how, how as a curator or as a, the person who is organizing, I, 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 I prefer to call it a curator or I feel much more attached. How can you take advantage of that, or how can you take something home then in the end? Like I think it's being together with the artists, understanding their practices while they are doing it. Sure. So uh, for me, curator is, I mean, it's, uh, in the end, it's just a terminology, but I think it's important to, 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 to understand the, 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 this terminology inside of this discipline itself, which is performance. Mm -hmm. right? That makes a difference, I think. Uh, I'm probably just an old-fashioned <laughs> from us artists and I don't like curators because they put too much control on me and I, I work, I work, I work and they take the credit for it. And, uh, I think it's that's, that's what happens most of the time because you have to do the work for them, explain everything, give them all the information, tell them how it should supposed to be. But you could do that yourself. I mean, that's how I feel. Obviously, there are curatorial projects when they come up with an idea and want you to do something. That's good. Yeah, that's that's the real curatorial work. When the curator come up with a great idea, but but they like to uh, create in a different situation and in situ some kind of an event. That's that's when they are important. So you're not against the curators; you're against bad curators. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the problem is that I mean. It's I mean, so many curators are, that curators. are uh, looking for the career scheme and all this stuff. I mean, that's, that's, I think that's a problem in, in the contemporary art world. I mean, the great Finnish performance artist and, and documentarist, Arki Piltola, when I met him the first time, actually, when I first started to meet performance artists, he said to me, I hate curators. And I said to him, I do so too. But actually, I have to do this exhibition. But and he is doing it still. But I mean, I think it's it's uh, you know it's, it's uh, curators who take care of the artists who are you know engaged with their work is one thing. And then you have those who are in, in, in the institutions who is just a kind of you know bureaucrat or something else. Why did this conversation get skewed from network to curation? Does that happen to every 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 single panel? That same thing happens. They get skewed for sure because we talk about what we want to talk about. But I would say it's actually this idea of curation, especially after that institutions by artists conference, is actually a central question to understand this network and, and how it works. Artists by however, institutions. it was called artists. By <laughs> yeah. Um, however, our time is up for today. Um, feel free to stay a little longer and and, and socialize. Uh, we welcome you, of course, tonight at Mercer Union, and the performance art dailies continue tomorrow after yoga and uh, the actions here in the morning. Thank you.